better late than never. Welcome. It's favorite. Yeah. It's fucking Anton Lander. Yeah. Oh, Let's go, baby. Bag milk. All right. Well, this Jesus, turns us down. Jesus. 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 Why not do another reaction episode Jesus. this week? Why not? Small trade today. Edmonton Oilers picked up Nick Bukestad for a third round pick and Michael Kesselring. Bukestad coming into town from Arizona. 50% retained. Major move? No. But it's a move. The most amazing thing about this trade, though, I think, at least for me, could be the cap gymnastics that the team had to do to get this done. According to Cap Friendly, the trade that the Edmonton Oilers did today puts them with zero cap space, not $1. I find that to be amazing. I don't know, like, do teams do that normally? (laughs) To me, the math is just incredible. Zero dollars. As somebody who's really bad at math, that's what I think about in this situation. It's not necessarily that this is somebody's job to do this math. And I imagine they've got the finest of calculators. But zero dollars. Nick Bukestad coming into town from the Arizona Coyotes. He's having a bounce back year. 13 goals. 10 assists, 23 points in 59 games for the Coyotes. The interesting thing about this is there was a bunch of Oilers prospect folks. Our boy Bruce Kerlock wasn't too pumped about this trade because he loves Michael Kesselring. The sixth round pick from 2018, 164 overall. Michael Kesselring is a right-hand shot defenseman. He's 23 years old. In 49 games with the Bakersfield Condors, he scored 13 goals and nine assists for 22 points. Having a little bit of a breakout year down in the pros. So, Bruce unhappy. And if Bruce is unhappy, I'm unhappy because I'm not going to pretend like I know anything about Michael Kesselring. Today at the office, Zach was talking about going down to see him. He covered the Condors a couple of weeks ago in Calgary. He liked the guy. Zach likes him, I like him. On Zach's article today, he says, even though I like the acquisition of Bukestad, I'm not really a fan of the Oilers moving on from Michael Kessering. I had a chance to see him back in early February when I was down in Calgary and was impressed with his play. Well, he's still got a ways to go of becoming an NHL player, namely with the work needed to do in the defensive zone. There has been a massive spike in offense this year from him, and that was a great sign about his future prospects in making the next level. Nick Bukestad was also, uh, there was another piece to this trade as well. Cam Deneen. He is a 24-year-old defenseman, 5'11". Left-hander and 50 points with the Tucson Roadrunners. He has four goals, 31 assists for 35 points. He is, you know, a little bit further along maybe than Michael Kesselring. He's also got some NHL games under his belt. 34 games with the uh, the Coyotes in 2021-22. Seven assists over that time. I don't know. Is he an interesting prospect? I'm not going to pretend. That's the thing that I'm not going to pretend like I know what I'm talking about here. Nick Bukestad makes the Oilers a little bit better right now. Doesn't he? You got to think so. Oilers needed a right-handed defense, uh, right-hand shot forward. I'm worried about Kyle Yamamoto. Last night, he got his bell rung. We all saw Nuge jump in there like a champion, just beat the tar out of that guy. I loved it. Stomped him. Nuge, no hesitation, just dropped the mitts, went in there and popped him. I loved it. Shout out to Nuge. (laughs) I like the guy in that button. He's really going for it like, yeah. Love that. That's for a Nuge scrap. That's the air horn for a Nuge scrap. Who doesn't love it? I mean, come on. Kyle Yamamoto gets leveled by Justin Hole. In my opinion, and I know people were arguing about it on Twitter. Don't yell at me. I'm, I'm over it, actually. I didn't like the hit on Kyle Yamamoto. I thought he was vulnerable. Took him out anyway. Nuge stepped in, handled his business. Throwing fists. Popped him right on the button. Couple of uppercuts. Down you go. 
Today, the Edmonton Oilers pull the trigger on a trade to bring in a right shot forward. Bukestad is not going to be a a big offensive guy or a big offensive guy. Yeah, he's not going to be an offensive guy for the Oilers, but he might chip in with a couple of goals. The way that Tyler always described him to me was long Derek Ryan. Long Derek Ryan sounds good. I like Derek Ryan. We all like Derek Ryan. Long Derek Ryan. Slightly younger. Long Derek Ryan. I like it. 19th overall pick of the Florida Panthers in 2010. Amazing that 2010 is 13 years ago now. Who allowed time to go by? I have a couple of thoughts about time going by. Listen, I waited years, centuries, millennia for my chance to get on this podcast. Or at least a broadcasting chance, for fuck's sakes. I am the Lord of Darkness. Come on. Anyway, sometimes you have to be patient with a guy. And sometimes things don't necessarily turn out as you hoped that they would. But for Nick Bukestad, he's having a good year. He's shooting at 12%. It's higher than his career average. But hey, pups are going in the net. What do you want? Satan chiming in actually with some reasonable numbers. On Nick Bukestad. The fancy stats people like him. That's what I find interesting. Offensive zone face-offs, 38%. So this dude just most of the time was starting in the defensive zone. According to natural stat trick, most of them were defensive zone. Neutral zone some. A bunch in the neutral zone. He had 166 faceoffs in the offensive zone, 297 in the neutral zone, and 271 in the defensive zone. So you can kind of see how the Coyotes were using the guy. Shooting percentage is over 12%, as Satan mentioned. Corsi, 46-41, if you care about that shit. It's hard to say what a guy is like when he's on a terrible team, but for Nick Bukestad, he's having a good year relative to what he always does. 12.9%, 12.09, I should say, shooting percentage is the highest of his career. Who knows? Minor trade for the Oilers. Interesting to see some people that weren't happy with Kessel Ring going out. Again, I don't know anything about it. Bruce Carlock didn't like it, so I don't like it. I follow Bruce's advice. That's what I do. If Bruce has a thought on a prospect, those are my thoughts now. I'm just going to regurgitate what he says and that's my thought on Michael Kesselring going out. If you've seen him, hit me up. Let me know. Go bag milk. This is a player that you'd probably like. It's annoying that the Oilers traded him. That's what Zach said. But let's get back to Bukestad. He's big. Six foot six, 209 pounds. The dude's gigantic. According to HockeyViz.com at even strength, Bukestad has contributed offense at 1% rate higher than league average and defense at a 7% rate above average. He spent some time on the penalty kill. has been a little bit ineffective, but again, who knows what's going on when you're playing with the Coyotes. The Oilers aren't going to be looking for much in the way of offense, though Bukestad is shooting at a career-high 12.09%. He's got a little bit of touch. He's going to bring a solid defensive presence. So there you go. Nick Bukestad. Uh, According to Puck IQ, Buke said played 32.9% of his time against elite competition, the most he's played since 2018-19. So the Coyotes were basically throwing him out here against the the best the other team had to offer. He's not going to have to do that against Edmonton. Like He's not going to be playing with Connor McDavid. He's going to get easier minutes. He's not going to get the tough assignments. So we'll see how he does. Guy's in on a heater. Third round pick and a prospect people like. Let me know what you think. Uh, The other thing I wanted to talk about today was, man, I don't know if you've seen the videos that the Nashville Predators have put out on their social media. If you go to OilersNation.com, if you haven't seen these videos, go to OilersNation.com, look for the article for this podcast. Better late than never, I'll have the, the little graphic I make, but I'll link to it in that article. So the Predators posted a video of Tyson Berry meeting a bunch of his new teammates in like a banquet hall or something. I don't know exactly know where they are, but they're all eating. And some of them don't even stand up to meet him. They just kind of turn around, shake his hand and go back to what they're doing. It's a really weird video, especially the way it was cut. Some of it doesn't even have sound. That leaves me to wonder why there's no sound. But you know what it does? It gave me vibes like 
If you've ever been the new kid going into a new class at school, that's what it looks like. He just, if you read the subtitles, he goes, Hey, my name's Tyson. Good to meet you. It's good to meet you. Hey, man, I'm so and so. What's going on? Hey, high five, high five. I feel for the guy. There's one thing about pro sports. It's a cold motherfucker, man. We were talking about F1. We were watching Drive to Survive, a bunch of us at the office. We were talking about the new season of The Office and just how in F1, you can just cut people midstream. Midseason, you're going to be like, well, we're going to just openly talk to somebody else or there's rumors about who's talking to who. You kind of forget about the human element of sports sometimes and just how pro sports can be cutthroat. In the case of Tyson Berry, the guy was having a great season with the Oilers. Looking to have his best year, probably. And then he gets shipped out. I'm not saying I'm... I, I get it, man. But you feel for the guy. You watch this video that the Predators put out, and you're just like, man, give the guy a break, dude. Like, put something together that's a little bit more polished, at least, that make it seem like his arrival's a big thing. I fell for Tyson Berry. Then again, I'm completely open to the idea that I'm making way too much about this video. Probably am. That's probably factual. These are my thoughts. This is my podcast. This is what you want me to do. This is what I get paid to do. Speaking of which, shout out to the audio department. Love you. The audio department.ca. South Island Pie Company. By the way, tomorrow is the trade deadline. We're going to have a bunch of stuff at Oilers Nation. I don't know when you're going to listen to this. Probably after the trade deadline. So if, you, if you're if you here at this point, the next Bukestad trade, I'll give it a, uh, well, I don't know. In terms of sexiness out of Nugent Hopkins, it's very low on the scale. Third round pick, don't care at all. I really don't care about a third round pick. Chances of them actually turning into something is next to nil. It happens. I'm not saying it doesn't. So when you were clip this or somebody's going to tweet at me and go, bag milk, there's a bunch of third round picks that play in the NHL. I understand that. That's not what I'm saying. Bag milk takes a bunch of these places. They all go out there. And they play. And they're a third round picks. <laughs> That's what you sound like to me. You're whining. I'm the whiner right now, to be honest. So the trade was meh. Meh. Like, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the rating I'm going to give it. Meh. Look at yourself in the mirror, the sound they make when you go meh. That's the Nick Bukestad trade. I hope it works out. He's a big dude. The Oilers need some depth. Again, I'm worried about Kyler Yamamoto after getting his bell rung again. Gregor wrote on the on Oilers Nation today that Yamo, like, I'm concerned about what's going on with that dude, if I'm being honest. Let me pull this up real quick. This is from Gregor's article today at OilersNation.com, and I quote, Yamamoto's health will determine if the Oilers can add a top six forward. I'm told there's some concern about his health. Is he one hit away from being out? When healthy, he is a solid player, but the Oilers lack wingers right now. So, we'll see. He goes on to say, Yamamoto's health is the main concern here. He's missed a month or two of separate occasions this season. The first was for a concussion when he was placed on the LTIR in January is due to a neck issue. His body was misaligned. He had a similar issue that Sidney Crosby had over a decade ago. For a long time, they thought it was concussion-related for Crosby, but it turned out to be his neck and vestibular, which impacted his balance. Yamamoto has said similar issues, and the hit from hold didn't help. Yamamoto is a perimeter player. He gets involved in plays, but his small stature often leads to him taking a lot of contact to the neck and head. It is unavoidable, and his health status will have a major impact on what Ken Holland does before the trade deadline. So Yamamoto's health is a concern. Nick Bukestad is not going to be Kyler Yamamoto. He's going to add depth on that right side. They absolutely need it. He can take some draws, though. He's at 40. He's under 48%, so it's very meh, meh. We'll see. We'll see. Frank Saravalli said he heard the Oilers could be done. So if they have nothing else to do, there won't be another emergency podcast. But if there is, I'll be back. I'm very excited, actually, post-trade deadline. I'm doing a South Island pie and wine tasting with Jay and Danger Suede. I'm super pumped about it. Red wine and a South Island pie. Go check them out at southislandpie.ca. I'm super pumped on them being a part of the podcast. If you're better, though, how many more trades tomorrow?
I don't know. Frank says he heard the Oilers may be done. If that's the case, I'm going to be a little bit bummed out. Love Matias Ekholm. First game was awesome. Dude's a rock star. Bukestad, we'll see. Meh. But we'll see if the Oilers get anything else done. That is where we're going to wrap up this emergency reaction episode of Better Late Than Never. <laughs>